All right, well, <clears throat> this morning we have the, um, the opportunity now to begin to dig in to the passage we read last week, and what I'd like to do is simply begin by reading the portion we're going to be looking at this morning, Luke 21, verses 5 through 19. So may the Lord bless this reading of His Word, and may He bless us so that we can understand what Jesus is talking about. And at the beginning, I want to remind you again of the context. Listen to the questions that the disciples are asking, because that, those are the questions that Jesus is answering, okay? So let's, let's uh, read this, and then we'll see what He is saying. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, He said, as for these things which you were looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when, therefore, will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes, and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, and relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish by your endurance. You will gain your lives. Well, again, that's just the first part, uh, and uh, we'll see which part of that is in, in just a moment. But first of all, let me just point out a few things that we were looking at uh, last week. And what I just pointed out at the very beginning, we're looking at Jesus' answer to the disciples' questions about the destruction of the temple, okay? The temple that was standing, the one they were looking at, the one they were pointing out to Jesus, the one that He said not one stone would be left upon another. Uh, they were asking when this would happen and what the sign would be that it was about to take place. Now, the first thing we noted is obviously the churches understood Jesus' answer to, this, to these questions in different ways. Dispensationalists believe that Jesus begins by addressing the temple that was then standing, but then quickly shifts uh, to the future, looks forward to His coming again to rapture the church just prior to a seven-year tribulation, and that much of what is spoken of here has to do with that tribulation. Amillennialists, uh, and I hope you understand some of these terms, they're really just shortcuts to differing views. But amillennialists, which I think our denomination is primarily, believe that, you know, something very similar to that, only the events, that, or I should say the event that he quickly shifts to from the temple then standing to the future is not a partial coming of Jesus just before a, um, uh, a seven-year tribulation and then the second coming takes place, but rather it shifts forward to the second coming and the Lord's final judgment upon the wicked just before He brings about the, the final judgment uh, where we stand before Him and have to give an account of our lives. So the majority of views see this still as primarily talking about the future. On the other hand, we saw that there's another group called moderate preterists who basically, again, preterist means, you know, past or uh, this has already happened, okay, and moderate in the sense that not all prophecy has been fulfilled, but these things have. 
they see these things as having happened really all in the past, what Jesus is referring to in Luke 21. These are the events that are leading up to and are taking place during 70 AD. That was the first thing we saw. Secondly, we saw three arguments as to why Jesus was speaking, why we should see him as speaking about events that have already taken, pa or taken place from our perspective. The first was because he was answering questions that had to do with the destruction of the temple that was then standing, the one that was then standing. He was speaking specifically about when that would happen, what the indications would be that it was about to take place, and he includes the sign that the time had actually come. And that's when they need to get out of the city as quickly as they could. Secondly, because in his answering this question, he was speaking directly to the disciples and telling them how they could know the judgment was near. While, you know, what they would have to endure before it took place and the help that he would give to them how they would know it had come and what they had to do when it actually did take place, as I've said, get out of the city. And then he also warned them to be on their guard so that it wouldn't catch them by surprise. And by the way, I hope you kind of note the, the interesting thing here is Jesus warned his disciples to be on their guard lest that day take them unaware like a thief who comes in the night, okay? He was warning them. Now, if Jesus was talking about the second coming, something that 2,000 years later still has not taken place, it's still future from our perspective, why would he be warning them to be on their guard, saying it could happen at any time? He was not talking about that second coming. He was talking about the Lord's coming in judgment. That is something they would have to face. So he was talking to them about it. And thirdly, we saw this is referring to a past event because of what Jesus said in verse 32, because what he says there limits these events to their lifetime. He says, this generation, those who were living at that time, will not pass away. They would not completely die off until all these things take place. Everything he was telling them that was going to happen in conjunction with the tearing down of the temple. Now again, Jesus said these things in 30 AD while the temple was standing, but they would all be fulfilled by 70 AD. Forty years were going to elapse. Not everyone's going to pass away before these things take place. And remember, too, the, the purpose of this judgment that he's speaking of. We don't see it as clearly in Luke's gospel as we do in Matthew's gospel. And we read last week, Matthew 23, where Jesus is telling us specifically why this is coming on them. This is his judgment on that generation of Jews that was not only going to crucify him, but kill his prophets and apostles. Jesus said, because of this, the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth uh, and really from the history of Israel, was going to be charged to that generation and their house would be left desolate. When you think about that, that's why the judgment was so severe. They killed Jesus. They killed his prophets and apostles. They killed his prophets throughout their history. So the judgment would be terrible on them. So again, Jesus was not talking about something that is future from our perspective, but of what was going to happen to Israel in the lifetime of his disciples. Now, with this in view, let's begin to work our way through this passage. Now, the whole sermon, and this really is a discourse, a sermon, that our Lord gives to his disciples can be broken down into three main sections. First of all, the signs that this judgment was near. Okay, what are the things that are going to happen as it's approaching? Secondly, the sign that it had come. Okay, now is the time. Now you need to respond. This is what you've been watching for. And then thirdly, his warning to his disciples to be ready. So that's the three sections we have here. And we're going to be looking at each of these over the next few Lord's Days. And we may actually take an extra Lord's Day to look at what Jesus meant by the signs in the heavens that he referred to. Uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars being darkened and falling from the heavens, including 
that of His coming on a cloud with great power and glory, since this is really one of the main reasons why there are those who see this as future. What was Jesus talking about when He said those things? Now, we're going to look at that not today. We're going to look at that uh, in a couple weeks, Lord willing. But let's begin by considering the signs Jesus gave that judgment, 70 A.D., was near. Now, Jesus gives us several, and it includes these. False Christs would arise. You'll hear of wars, rumors of wars. There'll be earthquakes, plagues, famines, and persecutions. So we want to look at that, and we also want to end by looking at the comfort Jesus gives that in spite of all that's coming, that Jesus says to them, not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Now, first of all, Jesus tells them there will be false Christs. He says in, um, let's see, in verse 8, See to it that you are not misled, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. Now, we've noted several times before that there was a general expectation among the Jews of that day that Messiah was coming and that he was coming to deliver them from Roman oppression. Jesus is telling his disciples that after his return to heaven, many would come claiming to be him, claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to take this role. In Mark's gospel, Jesus says their deception would be so powerful that there would be many who would follow them, not his followers that would follow them, but many of the Jews that would follow them. Now, church history, as well as the history that we have in the Bible, bears out that what Jesus said is exactly what happened. I mean, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 8, verse 9, that there was Simon Magus, remember, who first of all pretended to be a great one of God. Justin Martyr, who was an early defender of the Christian faith, who lived from the year 100 to 165 A.D. By the way, he was, when I said he's a defender of the Christian faith, he was an apologist, and uh, he was defending the Christian faith uh, against the charges of paganism, and in, in those days it would be against cannibalism and atheism, uh, of all things, because they were worshiping an invisible God. Cannibalism, because they were eating the body and blood of this one they claimed to worship, right? So misunderstanding the Lord's Supper, misunderstanding the, the nature of God. Well, he wrote in his first apology, and to understand this quote, you need to understand he was addressing this uh, to the Roman emperor, who at that time was Antonius, uh, Anto, Antoninus Pius. Okay. He writes this, After Christ's ascension into heaven, the devils put forward certain men who said that they themselves were gods. And they were not only persecuted by you, Antoninus Pius, but even deemed worthy of honors. In other words, you persecuted them, but you also honor them. There was a Samaritan, Simon, a native of the village called Gitto, who was in the reign of Claudius Caesar, and in your royal city of Rome did mighty acts of magic by virtue of the art of the devils operating in him. He was considered a god. And as a god was honored by you with a statue, which statue was erected on the river Tiber between the two bridges and bore this inscription in the language of Rome to Simon, the holy god? Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived through 70 AD and who actually wrote a, a history of that, tells us that around this time there were many deceivers and impostors who under the pretense of divine inspiration fostered revolutionary changes, okay? And these are the things I think more specifically. Jesus said there would be those who said they were he, that, that they, you know, I am he, I am the Messiah. Here we see revolutionary changes. Well, uh, one of the things that Josephus um, writes about, one of the things he records are the Jewish wars against Rome. There were those who, under the pretense of divine inspiration, fostered revolutionary changes. Josephus also writes of a self-proclaimed prophet by the name of Thutis. And by the way, there is a, Th a Thutis in Acts 5.36, but this is not the same one that Gamaliel mentions, but one who lived in the time of Claudius Caesar, who was the emperor of Rome from 41 to 54 A.D., 
who persuaded a large number of Jews to follow him to the Jordan, uh, which he claimed he would be able to command and the Jordan would divide. In other words, he claimed to be a prophet who had miraculous powers. John Gill, the well-known Baptist commentator, writes this, there was another called the Egyptian, mentioned in Acts 21:38, who made an uproar and led 4,000 cutthroats into the wilderness. And this same man persuaded 30,000 men to follow him to Mount Olivet, promising a free passage into the city but he, being vanquished by Felix, then governor of Judea, fled, and many of his followers were killed and taken. Gill also mentions um, Dositheus, the Samaritan, who claimed to be the Christ, and Menander, who said that no one could be saved unless they were baptized in his name. So again, Jesus said to his disciples that before the temple would be torn down, which is the period between 30 and 70 A.D., Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And that is exactly what happened. Now, secondly, he said there would be wars, earthquakes, plagues, and famines. He says in verses 9 through 11, when you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes, and in various places, plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. One thing I should mention, if you haven't caught this, he says, but the end does not follow immediately. What end is he referring to here? Well, in Matthew 24, the disciples actually asked three questions, and uh, Jesus only, uh, well, I should say Luke only mentions two of them. The third question is, when, what is the sign of the end of the age? And then the question comes, what does he mean by the end of the age? And it appears as though the answer to that question is the end of the old covenant economy because in 70 AD, the temple is torn down and the Old Testament economy is, the old covenant is completely demolished. And then the New Testament covenant in its fullness comes and it begins from that point on. So that, I think, is what is referring to there by the end. But what Jesus is saying here, first of all, is this, the peace of Rome the so-called Pax Romana, is going to come to an end, at least temporarily. There would be war. Now, Origen, one of the church fathers, tells us that uh, there was an abundance of peace that began at the birth of Christ. Now, humanly speaking, this peace came through Rome's dominion, and it extended throughout the, the, the whole world. And by the way, the whole world at that time meant the Roman Empire. That was the whole world. And it was that Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, that made the spread of the gospel possible. I mean, just think about it. If you had all these nations that were at war with one another, you wouldn't be able to move freely from one country to another. The fact that there was world dominion at that time, the, uh, the empire of Rome made it possible. The Roman roads that were built, the peace, the safety, that's how the gospel spread so quickly throughout the world, okay? So there was peace. But Tacitus, a Roman historian, wrote that in the year 68, 69 AD, the same year that Nero died, this peace was ruptured by the outbreak of the Jewish war against Rome and the Roman civil wars. You know, when, when a Caesar dies, uh, who's going to be the next Caesar? Well, that, um, that year was called the violent year of four emperors who were all seeking to become the next Caesar. John Gill writes this, here wars may mean the commotions, insurrections, and seditions against the Romans and their governors, so perhaps by the, by the Jews, and the internal slaughters committed among them sometime before the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of it. Under Quirinius, the, gov the Roman governor, a sedition was raised on the day of the Passover in which 20,000 perished. After that, in another tumult, 10,000 were destroyed by cutthroats. In Ascalon, 2,000 more. In Ptolemaeus, uh, 2,000. At Alexandria, 50,000. At Damascus, 10,000. And elsewhere in great numbers. The Jews were also put into great consternation upon hearing the design of the Roman emperor to put up his image in their temple. 
By the way, that, that's very uh, key because that is referring to something, at least part of what it's meant by the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it should not stand in the holy place. Jesus said there would be wars and rumors of wars, and that's exactly what happened during that time frame. He said there would be earthquakes. Tacitus writes of a terrible earthquake during the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, in, who reigned from 14 to 37. He says, quote, that same year, 12 famous cities of Asia fell by an earthquake in the night, so that the destruction was all the more unforeseen and fearful. Nor were there the means of escape usual in such a disaster by rushing out into the open country, for their people were swallowed up by the yawning earth. Vast mountains, it is said, collapsed. What had been level ground seemed to be raised aloft, and fires blazed out amid the ruin. The calamity fell most fatally on the inhabitants of Sardis, and it attracted to them the largest share of sympathy." There would be earthquakes. Jesus said there would be famines. Luke tells us of a famine that was prophesied by Agabus that took place sometime during the, the reign of Claudius from 41 to 54. This may have been the same one that took place in Jerusalem after the, the death of Herod Agrippa in 44 AD that claimed the lives or many lives and that Josephus writes about in his Antiquity of the Jews. Tacitus also writes that during the time of Claudius, birds Quote, birds of evil omen perched on the capital. Houses were, were thrown down by frequent shocks of earthquake. And as the panic spread, all the weak were trodden down in the hurry and confusion of the crowd. Scanty crops, too, and co a consequent famine were regarded as a token of calamity. So there were, again, earthquakes and famines and plagues. The Roman historian Suetonius writes that during the reign of Nero, which was from 54 to 68, there was a great plague that in a single autumn killed 30,000 people. Tac Tacitus writing about this or possibly another uh, plague during Nero's reign said this, a year of shame and of so many evil deeds, heaven also marked by storms and pestilence. Campania was devastated by a hurricane which destroyed everywhere country houses, plantations, and crops and carried its fury to the neighborhood of Rome where a terrible plague was sweeping away all classes of human beings without any derangement of the atmosphere as to be visibly apparent. Yet the houses were filled with lifeless forms and the streets with funerals. Remember, I, I quoted uh, our Lord saying just a few moments ago, there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. I think this is what he was referring to, you know, the wars, the earthquakes, the plagues, the famines, but also the, the, the terrifying weather that, that was destroying the houses. He could have possibly been referring to what's ahead uh, in our next passage, but I think this is what he's talking about. These things were coming from heaven, which doesn't necessarily mean that you see the heavens changing but that they were sent from God. They came from heaven, these devastating things upon the earth. Now, Jesus said, thirdly, there would also be persecution. He says in verses 12 through 17, but before all these things, they will lay hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. By the way, think about what Jesus just said here, and think about what we see in the book of Acts. I mean, doesn't this sound like a summary of what we see happening in this inspired history? Stephen was <clears throat> stoned by the Sanhedrin for his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. After Stephen was stoned, Saul instituted an empire-wide persecution against the Christians. 
dragging them to Jerusalem to stand trial and to be put to death. And Paul reminds us, Saul, when he was, you know, the Pharisee Saul, that he held the coats of those that were stoning Stephen, watched them, make sure nobody took them. And when the Christians were being put to death, he cast his vote against them. Herod put James to death with a sword. He also had Peter arrested and would likely have executed him if the Lord had not sent his angel to free him. Paul, once he becomes a Christian and, of course, one of the apostles of our Lord and in his evangelistic endeavors was threatened many times, beaten many times, stoned once. He gives us a whole catalog in 2 Corinthians 11 of the difficulties he had to endure. He stood before governors and kings. We see that also in Luke's account. And finally, before Caesar. So Jesus is saying that before 70 AD comes, you're going to have to go through all of these things. You're going to be persecuted. But he also said he would be with them to give them strength, to give them the ability to proclaim his gospel with courage before those who persecuted them. I mean, think of Stephen before the Sanhedrin. Think of Paul before Caesar proclaiming that truth. Think of him before Felix and Festus. Uh, they were fearless in their proclamation of the gospel. Jesus said, this is what's going to happen, but I'm going to be with you to give you strength. Jesus also added one additional indicator of the nearness of his judgment in Mark's gospel. He says this in Mark 13, verse 10. The gospel must first be preached to all nations. Now, again, this, this is one of the reasons why believers are tempted to think that this is referring to the future because the whole world has not yet been evangelized. But we do need to remember that to the disciples, all the nations, the whole world did not mean everything that God had created in this globe we call earth, but it was referring to the Roman Empire. Okay? Luke writes in Luke 2 verse 1 regarding the birth of Jesus and the census. He says this, now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Now, we know that Augustus did not take a census of the whole world. I mean, he wasn't finding out how many people were living at the tip of Africa or South America or things of that nature. But he did take a census of all the Roman territories. That was the whole world. The Jews in Thessalonica said of Paul and his companions when, when they arrived in Acts 17, verse 6, these men who have upset the world have come here also. Now, what did they mean by that? Uh, they didn't mean that, again, that they had upset the Americas and the American Indians or the Aztecs, right? But he meant that they had disturbed virtually the whole world through their evangelism, the whole Roman Empire, because that was where they had been ministering. Jesus is saying that the gospel would be preached to all the nations in the Roman Empire, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles, before judgment would come in 70 AD. And that is exactly what happened. Think about what Paul wrote to the Colossians from his first Roman imprisonment around 60 AD. He first of all thanks you know, God that the gospel had come to them, but then he adds in verse 6 this, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Notice Paul says the gospel was bearing fruit in all the world. What did he mean by that? He didn't mean the entire globe, but he meant the entire Roman Empire. <coughs> so, this gospel is going to be preached to the whole world, to the whole Roman Empire, before the end comes. Finally, as I've said, okay, those are the signs that, that um, uh, this coming judgment where the temple is going to be torn down, these are the signs that it was drawing near. Finally, Jesus gives, at least for our purposes this morning, gives a word of encouragement to his disciples, though they were going to go through all of this, he says, though you're going to go through all of this, he says in verses 18 and 19, yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. 
Now, first of all, we should note that I don't, you know, that Jesus here cannot be talking about their physical lives as though if they made it through all these difficulties, these wars and, and the destruction of Jerusalem, that they would then be safe, that he was going to keep them through. None, none of them were going to die because he already told them in verse 16, some of them were going to die. He says, but you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Okay, So some of them were going to die. He's not talking about their physical lives here. Uh, Jesus says in, in Matthew 24 something very similar, the one who endures to the end will be saved. What is he referring to here? Well, I think he's, again, talking about their souls. If they continue to hold on to Jesus and trust in Him and do His work through everything that was coming, which they would be able to do by His grace, not even one hair of their head would ultimately perish Essentially, they would be, they would receive eternal life. And, and remember, eternal life salvation refers to body as well as soul, doesn't it? Our body is going to be raised someday and glorified. So ultimately, not one hair of our heads is going to perish, but it's all going to be reserved for us. Jesus is basically telling us that God gives to everyone who trusts in Him the grace that we need to persevere to the end, whatever it is we have to face, and finally enter into glory. That promise does not apply just to them. That promise also applies to us. But what I want, to see, what I want us to see this morning is this, that Jesus is saying this to his disciples with regard to what is about to come upon them. Okay? The promise is applied to them because these things were going to affect them. Now, I told you last week that, um, you know, if we're looking at something that took place in the past, it's not going to have um, the relevance to us that we might think it has. This is not something that is going to affect us. So we have to draw our lessons from this in a different way. And I told you there's going to be a recurring refrain through, through uh, these next several weeks. And so let me give you that refrain again now. You know, what, what does this mean for us? Well, it means, first of all, again, that these events are not ahead of us. These events are behind us. We don't need to be looking for these things. We don't need to be concerned about these things. I think the majority of the church today is concerned that these events that Jesus is referring to here are just around the corner. So if they're taking these things seriously, they're in alarm mode all the time. I've, I've had well-meaning Christians tell me, you know, that I might not be able to take a step before Jesus Christ comes. That he might come in the next hour. Well, I, I don't think that's the case. I think it's still going to be a little while. I don't think He's coming in our lifetime, and that may shock some people. But that is one of the views of, of what Jesus is saying here. He's not talking about us. He's talking about the disciples and what the Jews were going to have to go through in 70 A.D. So rather than looking for this event... And the signs that are leading up to this event, which has already taken place, we simply need to focus on doing what our Lord called us to do, which is being faithful with what He has given us in bringing the gospel to other places and maybe to look ahead to a little bit of, op you know, being, being a little bit optimistic about what's ahead. You know, we're, we're not just struggling to keep our head above water. The Lord may yet have great things that He's going to do, perhaps other revivals he's going to pour out, as he seems to be doing now in Uganda in, in the, you know, the work that the Robins are involved in. Perhaps there is room for optimism if we don't have this, you know, this devastating event that's ahead of us. If that actually is behind us, then perhaps there is room for optimism as to what the Lord is yet going to do during this present time. So first of all, it means don't be looking for this. Look instead at to, to do what the Lord has, has called you to do in this particular day. It means, secondly, obviously, that since Jesus was able to predict with such accuracy, to prophesy about the things that were coming, that He is a true prophet and what He claims about Himself is also true. And that is that He is the Savior, the only Savior of the world, it's only through Jesus Christ that anyone can be saved. And unless 
people hear about Him, they will not be saved. You know, the funny thing is that when you, when you see even Christians often being interviewed in public television, you'll hear them talk about God and the Lord and all these things, but you won't hear them name the name of Jesus because that name is so offensive to so many people. But He is the only Savior, and He is the one we need to tell the people about what Jesus Christ has actually done. So He is the only Savior. And we need to remember the two, that He is the Lord, okay? So as our Savior, if we have embraced Him, we do need to follow Him. We do need to obey Him because He is God in our nature. He is the King. He is the Messiah, okay? And He is the one who is ruling and reigning right now. Now, it means, third, that whatever Jesus says He's going to do, He is going to do. I mean, he, doesn't, he doesn't just say things that, like we do, you know, just saying things that he's not serious about, uh, saying things in anger, saying things in jest. Whatever he says is the absolute truth. Now, Jesus said that this judgment was going to come upon the Jews. He said all these things were going to take place. They actually did take place. And when he says that those who reject him are going to be rejected by him, that is true. It's also true that those who receive him will be protected by him. That also is true. Now think about that in terms of what is really yet ahead of us. It's appointed unto man once to die and then comes the judgment. What Jesus says there through the author to the Hebrews is also true. When we die, we go to one of two places and there is a day of judgment yet ahead of us. If we receive Jesus and his word, if we love him and follow him, he will receive us on that day. And by the way, the loving and following him is the evidence that we have truly received Jesus. But if we reject him and his word, he also will reject us. Jesus said, many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, you know, you're my Lord. And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You didn't listen to me. You didn't listen to my word. You didn't do what I said. You don't belong to me, so depart from me. We must take what the Lord says very seriously. And then finally, it means, of course, this, that when the Lord gives a greater privilege, where he gives more truth, there is a greater judgment for the rejection of that truth. Again, consider what happened to the Jews. This is the worst thing that has ever happened to anyone, and it's because they had the greatest privileges. We need to make sure that as we have received greater privileges, you know, more truth, the Word of God, everything that we have to enjoy here, and particularly in the reform camp where we have so much light, we need to make sure that we receive what the Lord has given to us. We need to make sure, as we've been warned again and again and again through the Word of God, as the Puritans have warned us, we need to make sure that we are not Christians in name only, right? What does that mean? We talk about nominal Christians. Nominal Christianity means that, that there are people who claim to be Christians but it's only a title, it's only a name, there's no reality. We need to make sure we're not just calling ourselves Christians, but that we're really not trusting Jesus. We're really not following Him, we're really not obeying Him. We need to make sure we're trusting Him. And by His grace, we are doing everything we can, devoting our lives to honor Him. The Lord takes what he says very seriously, salvation and judgment. We need to make sure we receive his salvation and we do his works, the evidence of that salvation, and that we don't take it for granted that we really do belong to him. Now, as I've said, this sermon is divided into three sections. These are the signs that would take place just prior to his coming. Next time we're going to consider, and that's his coming in judgment in 70 A.D., Next time, we're going to consider the sign that shows that his judgment had come. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by her enemies, then, then basically you know uh, it has come. Then get out of there, okay? So uh, that, that we'll look at next time. But for now, let's just bow in a moment of prayer.
Let's ask the Lord very humbly and, and to mercifully help us to hear what it is that Jesus is saying through this text and to let that affect our lives, that again, we might, we might uh, benefit from this. We might become more of what our Lord Jesus wants us to become, that it might change us into the image of Jesus. Let, let's pray.